So today we're going to be talking about remote management of self-storage facilities. So we're going to hit on a few different topics. We're going to talk about some of the benefits and challenges, so pluses and minuses of, of managing a facility remotely. We're going to talk about some pitfalls to avoid when you are transitioning a facility that you acquire that is currently operated um, tr uh, the traditional attendant model that you want to then take un unmanned. We'll talk about some considerations there, things we need to make sure we take care of to make that transition smooth as possible. And then we'll talk about some underwriting considerations because these underwrite a little bit differently, both on the operations side and on the exit side. Uh, so there's some things that we need to understand. I'm going to share just some lessons you know, that we've learned as we've done this before. Uh, so I think this will be a really exciting topic. So let's go ahead and jump right in. Um, we'll talk about some benefits and challenges of managing facilities remotely. So the most obvious benefit that most people will think of when they think of remote management is that you have reduced operating cost uh, to a large extent. You generally are gonna save a lot on your payroll cost when you go unmanned management or unattended. Um, so, and as we know, as real estate investors, that translates typically to a higher valuation. You increase your NOI, your bottom line, you're going to increase your valuation, all other things held equal. Uh, in addition to the lower payroll costs, you might have some minimal uh, decrease on your insurance costs. You're not going to have uh, workers comp. You'll have to make sure that your, you know, boots on the ground person that we'll talk about in a minute, you have to make sure that you're covered for the work that they're doing but you will have some reduction in those insurance costs as well, sort of the employment related things. Another benefit in addition to the reduction in cost is you will have a lighter uh, people management responsibility. So, you know, when you've got a fully uh, manned, fully attended facility, there's a lot of people management that's gonna be involved with that manager because that manager is an employee that you want to help develop. You want them to excel at their job and. Um, excel in their life. So that takes some time to uh, be managing that person and being a good manager. When you have an unattended facility that your uh, your employee that's on site is more of a part-time, you know, showing up a couple, two or three times a week to take care of uh, the facility, there's less people management that's re that revolves around that. So you have more time to focus on other things. Maybe that's acquiring properties. Maybe that's uh, you know, whatever it is that you need to spend more time on. So those are a couple of uh, benefits there. It's also easier to hire a boots on the ground person than it is to hire a full-time manager. Uh, when you're talking about a full-time on-site manager, you need to hire somebody who's got the ability to sell. You need to hire somebody who's got the ability to build relationships those are not things that you need to have in your part-time boots on the ground person that you're hiring when you're gonna manage a facility remotely or unattended. Uh, so it is easier to hire that person because you don't have to have those, those skills um, as uh, in the person's skill set. So those are some benefits to running the facility uh, this way. Uh, there are some challenges that we need to think through if we're going to run a facility unattended. First of all, is sort of a sort of a macro um, issue, is that there are some markets that just don't get the unattended model yet. Um, what we found is that there are there's some markets, for example, college towns, uh, where you have a lot of college kids that are renting. They love this. You know, the that the younger generation they would rather not have to talk to somebody to rent a unit. And they think it's the best thing ever that you can just go on your go on your phone and rent a unit and go up to the uh, you know go right up to the unit, put your stuff in there, and then be done. Uh, uh, you know, a lot of people they they love that. There are some markets where the demographics are a little bit different, and they prefer to have somebody with a personal touch involved. Um, in those cases, it may be harder to run a facility unmanned and keep it occupied. Uh, or fully occupied anyway. Um, so we have to be aware of, you know, is what are the demographics of this market? Is this a market that will, you know, will uh, will adapt to a uh, remote managed facility, or maybe some of the competitors are already remote managed? Maybe that gives you a little bit of uh, proof in the pudding. So 
but the point is in this in this challenge is we just need to understand that there are some markets that get this better than others do um, i see a question coming in here would you say the current trend of self-storage management headed toward the remote business model and uh what's the practice in our company yes the trend is headed this way um, I'll qualify that a little bit by saying that it is it's very much a hybrid right now. Uh, the you know your your bigger REITs, so like public storage, extra space, uh, they are starting to manage a lot of facilities remotely. But typically, it's a hybrid where they might have a part-time employee who is there eight hours a day, three days a week, and it's uh, managed remotely the other two days. Uh, that's the most common thing that we see out there um, in, in terms of where remote management is implemented. But it does seem to be seeing, um, it does seem to be trending that way. And we go to a lot of trade shows uh, for self-storage association and those kind of things. And that's usually a topic at some point is what's the status of the remote uh, management model. Um, so we have some facilities to answer the second part of the question. What's the practice for, uh, for us at PassiveInvesting.com? We have a mix. We have some facilities where we found that to operate the facility in the best way possible, we do need to have an on-site person for some of the reasons that I just mentioned. And we found some that they're set up much better, the market much better adapts to an unattended facility. So we do both uh, to answer that question, but uh, good question there, Eric. Uh, so, uh, returning back to challenges of the of the remote management model, we talked about some markets get this better than others do. Uh, another challenge is when you when you are managing a facility remotely, you don't have a person on site who can close the deal when you're in a situation where you need that. So the w one of the uh, qualities that we found gets overlooked sometimes when you're hiring an on site manager is that person's ability to sell. You really need a salesperson um, on site for uh, in a, in a lot of situations. Uh, it doesn't mean you can't rent units without them. You know, like I said, we do run some facilities totally unmanned, uh, with, with of course the boots on the ground, you know, part time person. Uh, but it, so it doesn't mean you can't rent units at all, and it doesn't really mean you can't keep your facility full. It just means that there are some customers who do like that personal touch. And if you don't have a salesperson, you know, your on-site manager there to close the deal, that does have an impact. So it's an impact that we need to consider as investors uh, when we are underwriting a property. Uh, so another challenge, you just don't have that, uh, that salesperson there that you do have when you run a facility attended. One other challenge that I wanted to mention is just the, the challenge of maintaining uh, cleanliness and security at the property. Um, as as with the other challenges, there are ways to overcome this. You know, if you're running a facility well unattended, you can run a clean and secure facility. Um, but it is just it's a challenge that we have to consider. You know, if you're not laying eyes on the facility every day, things are going to happen. You know, the gate's going to malfunction. You know, weeds are going to grow. Trash is going to get left when somebody moves out of their unit, and they're too lazy to you know take the trash with them. Things are going to happen. So we just have to make sure that we are set up to respond to those things, do our best to prevent them, but be set up in the best way possible to respond to those things when they cannot be prevented. So those are some uh, benefits, some challenges to managing our facilities uh, unattended. Let's talk about when we've acquired a facility that is being managed um, uh, fully uh, um, on site, attended. Let's talk about some pitfalls to avoid when we are transitioning those to um, to unattended or remotely managed facilities. The biggest piece of advice that I can give you here in this area is don't go fully remote cold turkey. Um, there's a few reasons for this. At a high level, if you go in there, you buy a facility and you immediately remove the manager, you can, especially if you raise rents immediately and remove the manager, it gives your customers the perception that you don't care about them. So if you put yourself in that customer's shoes, especially if you're in a demographic that they like that personal touch, if you have a new landlord, you know, you, you got a new owner of the facility, that customer might view that as you are providing less service. You know, you, you don't have an on-site person there to 
you know, answer their questions and things like that. You're providing less service and you just raise their rent. That's not good. That's not the way that we want to do business anyway. Uh, so we want to avoid that perception that can be um, can be given to customers if we go uh, remote, just cold turkey immediately. Uh, that is a mistake that we've made in the past that we've learned from. Um, and that's one that I always recommend to people who are considering this type of management. And in addition to avoiding that perception, if you at least maintain or retain a manager there for some period of time, that manager can be very helpful in walking your tenants through that change when it comes. And the tenants, ultimately, they want to know that they're going to be safe when they're on site, and they want to know that their things are going to be secure uh, when they're off site and when you're off site. Uh, so the on-site manager can help them understand, hey, you know, here's the security uh, features that we have here. Here's what we're going to be doing, how we're, how we're going to make sure that this is a safe place, even when there's not somebody on site. That's very helpful to have a manager there who can walk them through that change when you're going from totally manned to totally unmanned. Uh, so don't go fully remote cold turkey. That's the biggest uh, piece of advice that I have for you there. Uh, another would be consider the timing of rent increases. So I alluded to that a little bit in the first um, uh, the first one there, but you don't want to raise rents too close to the time of transition from fully uh, fully uh, um, fully manned to fully unmanned. Uh, when you do that, it again it gives that perception that you're offering lower service for a higher price, and that's not going to turn out well for you. So you want to make sure that you are either raising rents, you, you're maintaining the manager there to help walk those customers through those rent, rent increases, or you want to go unmanned. You want to make sure that you've got all of your kinks worked out that may come up. You want to make sure that you are offering still a good quality of service to your tenants and then push the rents up to market if that's what your business plan is for the property. So consider the timing of your rent increases. A final thing in this area, a pitfall to avoid or just a recommendation uh, to follow as you do this, uh, you should consider if you need any security or logistical improvements. Uh, customers, again, they need to know that they're going to be safe, that their things are going to be safe, uh, safe. They also need to know how to rent a unit when they drive up to your facility. So we often assume you know, it's it's 2023. People are going to find you on Google, you know, before they find you anywhere else. And that's generally going to be true. But you are going to have some people who they've driven by your facility for years and they've never really needed storage. But all of a sudden they do. You know, there's been something that's changed in their life and all of a sudden they need a unit. And they'll remember, hey, I, I drive by that place every day. You know, it's convenient. Let me go drive in and see if I can talk to a manager and, um, you know, rent a unit. Well, there's no manager there. They need to know, how do I rent a unit? So uh, we've used uh, just different signage uh, around the proper, our properties um, to accomplish this. We've also had window decals that have been put up. So if they come up and there's nobody in the office at the time, then they can see even on the window that there's instructions, maybe a QR code or something that shows them, hey, here's how you rent a unit here. If you have questions, if you have trouble, here's the number you call. Um, so they need to understand that information. So we need to consider, are there logistical improvements that we need to make? Maybe there are uh, security improvements. Maybe we need more cameras. You know, maybe there's additional monitoring services that we need. Um, you know, just those are the kind of things that we want to make sure that we are thinking through when we are transitioning a facility like this. Another thing in this area, this um, uh, logistical improvements area and security improvements, the facility, this is a very important point, your facility cannot look abandoned. So if you go unmanned, again, you know, this is that you can run a facility successfully this way. Um, you know, we've done it. We have other owners that we know that are doing it very well, but you cannot allow the facility to look abandoned. So if you have, if you have a facility that's got an office and you're just running it unattended, that's fine. But you can't just turn off the lights and lock the office door and expect people to not you know, be kind of uneasy a little bit uh, when they 
approach your facility and it looks like there's nobody there or it's obvious that there's you know nobody there and it just doesn't look safe. So a couple of things that you can do here uh, to you you really want to try to activate the office really to avoid this abandoned look. Um, a few different ideas that we've done there. You can sort of create model unit sizes in the office so people can use those to kind of decide what help them decide what size unit they need. So you could mark off, um, you know, you'd want to do this in a nice looking way, but you could mark off, you know, here's the dimensions of a 10 by 10 unit, here's a 10 by 15, and so on. Uh, so you're you're activating the office. There's a way the office is actually helping you sell your units, even though there's not a person there. Another thing that you can do is have your security feeds uh, go. Uh, going into um, the television screens in the office that helps with perception of security. Hey, you know, there's nobody in the office right now, but your stuff is still being monitored. You know, the, this area is still being monitored. This is a safe place. That's what that says when you have those security feeds coming in. Um, the other thing that I alluded to before that we do is window decals. So we have decals that go over in our unmanned facilities they go over the windows to the office. So it, it, you avoid the look of an abandoned facility um, and it, uh, when you have those, those decals up. Have, and again, they'll have a QR code, they'll have instructions, they'll have a number to call if you have issues. Um, so whatever you can do to activate the office to your advantage and to avoid making it look abandoned, that's something that you're gonna wanna make sure you think through as you transition a facility from attended to unattended. A couple questions I see that have come in here before we move on. Uh, with regards to the cold turkey shift to remote management, what, sh what would the perception be if the newly acquired facility was run as a mom and pop? Uh, that's a good question. And it, it really, I, I wouldn't say there's a rule of thumb in that area. It really just kind of depends, you know, what are the demographics of, wh what's the rent roll look like, maybe is another way to say it. Um, if you've got, you know, the, the primary demographic in a rent roll is, you know, uh, the example I use, college students that they didn't want to talk to anybody anyway, you know, they're not going to, uh, they're, they're not really going to care. If you've got a rent roll full of people who do like that personal touch, then yeah, the perception might not be great. They might say, well, hey, you know, you just bought my, you just bought this facility you know, and you raise my rent and now you're offering me less service. Um, so a lot of times, um, I think a lot of times with mom and pop facilities, they, they attract people who like that personal touch because usually the mom and pop owner are those relational type people that are good at that personal touch. Um, so that is a good question and something that you'll want to make sure you think through uh, as you're looking at acquisitions. Uh, let's see, at facilities that are unmanned, do you use QR codes at the facility to drive tenants to customer service? Uh, do you think QR codes are now universally understood? Uh, yes, definitely, that's the way to go. Um, have those QR codes for the, at least for the, um, uh, for the rent page. Um, but yeah, it, customer service should also be easy to get to there. Yeah, they're very well, um, they're here to stay, um, in my opinion. Uh, let's see, what is the typical profile of the individual you hire as the boots on the ground? Since it is part, since it is a part-time on-demand situation, is that individual usually an older retired individual? Uh, yeah, that's a good question. Um, I, as far as whether it's an, uh, a more elderly or a retired person, um, we, have, we have hired uh, those people before that they've retired and they're looking for something to do. Um, and they like to take care of property. Uh, we've definitely had those. They've worked out very well. Uh, we've also had sort of the more, um, for lack of a better word, the more handyman type uh, that that's what they're good at. That's what they enjoy doing. And uh, they're just looking for work. Uh, so it's, we've, I, I guess, I don't know that there's a typical profile. You really, biggest thing with, with the boots on the ground is you want somebody who cares. Um, so, you, you, you want somebody who can really take ownership, Sim similar to the uh, a full-time manager, you want somebody who can take ownership of the facility. Um, for example, we have, uh, we have a store in, uh, out in Colorado uh, 
where we have a very, very, we, we have very solid managers at all of our stores, uh, but we have one who started out as the boots on the ground person, and he was doing a fantastic job uh, at the property, really takes a lot of ownership. And we ended up deciding to staff that store, have it fully manned. And he was a logical choice and he's been outstanding um, as he's continued to manage the, the property um, fully manned now. Uh, so yeah, there's not really a typical profile. It's just, you're looking for somebody who really cares, who's really taken ownership. And um, our uh, property management company that we work with has been very good about hiring very good uh, people in that regard. Uh, last question here, how are boots on the ground paid? Hourly, contractual, per activity? Yeah, usually it's hourly. Um, that's usually what it's set up as. Uh, sometimes we have a contractual rate, you know, we'll pay you this much per month to do this. Um, you know, you just kind of have to figure out what works uh, with that with that person and for you. Uh, let's see, I see another question here. What security uh, camera monitoring systems do you like? Is it ADT or a specialized remote management company uh, specific for self-storage? Um, that is actually not uh, a question that I know the answer to. Um, I have not, uh, I, I don't, I'm not managing the security contracts there. It's a good question. Um, I would recommend you look at um, uh, inside self storage or uh, some of the other, you know, publications that we've referred to here before. Um, they, uh, um, that's probably the best place to look at, uh, you know, different monitoring systems. Or if you are planning on using third party management, which we usually recommend, um, they would they would be the ones that would be uh, very instrumental for you on that. Um, another question. I'm glad we got a lot of uh, questions today. Would you agree that women are actually the business or the decision makers in which self storage facilities to rent from? Do you think it would make sense to hire women as boots on the ground? Um, it's an interesting question. Uh, I do know from everything that we read, it does sound like the majority, I hear different percentages, but the majority of storage units are rented by women. Um, they're, they seem to be the ones that that's, that they're the one making that decision, as, as you said. Um, it's definitely something we need to think about. Uh, you know, we need to know who our customer is, um, how they want to be treated. You know, we, we want to treat others not how not necessarily how we want to be treated, but how they want to be treated. Um, as far as what it makes sense to hire women as boots on the ground, I think that's an interesting uh, possibility. Um, I, I don't think there's, I don't think you can really go wrong either way. Uh, but yeah, it's an interesting uh, consideration there. Um, so yeah, thanks for that. Uh, appreciate all the uh, the questions today. Uh, so those are some pitfalls uh, to avoid as we are transitioning from a fully uh, manned to an unmanned facility, let's talk uh, quickly about some underwriting considerations. So I mentioned at the beginning that there were some considerations with our operating budget and there were some considerations for underwriting our exit. The operating budget, the one thing I wanted to say here is just to know that you will have some payroll costs. You're not gonna go from paying a full-time person to paying a no-time person. You are gonna have um, that boots on the ground that's very, very important. Uh, and to get somebody who want, who actually cares and will take ownership, uh, you need to have you need to you need to pay that person. Um, so definitely talk with if you're using third party management, definitely talk with your property manager about how much that you should be paying that person. If you are self managing it and you're hiring that uh, boots on the ground person yourself, just make sure you have a good idea of how many hours you're going to need that person, what hourly rate is appropriate. Um, and just uh, just know the main thing in this point is just to know you will have some payroll costs. Uh, you're not going to go to zero payroll cost. The other thing, what's I think a little bit more important when we're underwriting a um, an unmanned facility is we need to consider how we are looking at our exit. So not everybody, um, Eric asked a good question earlier about is this the trend? It is the trend, not everybody is there yet. Um, so, and we, we've we experienced this both uh, personally and both by talking with, uh, and both, uh, and also with talking to other owners. Um, 
the REITs have implemented, so like public storage, extra space, they've implemented a lot of remote management, but very few REIT uh, managed facilities are fully unmanned. So what that means for us on the underwriting side, you know, these institutional groups, generally they are going to underwrite a full-time manager at the property. So if your goal is to sell your facility to public storage or CubeSmart or whoever, you need to, you need to understand that most likely they're going to be underwriting having a full-time manager there. So let, I wanted to look at an example of how uh, that impacts um, the underwriting. I'm going to share my screen. All right. So this is just a really quick, uh, you know, um, model of how this how this impacts um, our our underwriting in terms of how a buyer looks at our facility. So in this scenario, we've got a facility. We are running it unmanned here in Column C, and this facility has a two hundred fifty thousand dollar NOI. Um, if a if we're going to sell it to public storage, they're going to add a person. Um, this is always going to be market specific in terms of how much it's going to cost. But just for these purposes, I'm saying we're going to assume that their expenses are going to go up by $30,000. Uh, assuming nothing else changes, you know, the rents don't change, which is not going to be the case. But again, we're just trying to do apples to apples the best we can here. They've got a $220,000 NOI since their operating costs went up by $30,000. let us say we are in a six cap market. If you were buying this facility, you might look at this and say, well, if it's a six, six cap, then I should be able to pay about this much, this $4 million um, and change. A buyer who's going to put a manager there, they're going to say, well, this is a six cap market. If that's the NOI, then I can pay about this much, $3.6 million. So this 3.6 million is what your facility is probably worth. That is not a six cap on your NOI. That if you do the math, that's a 6.81 cap on your NOI. So what's the point of this? The point is when we are projecting what our exit cap is gonna be, and we've talked about how to do that on other webinars, when we're projecting that, we need to understand that our exit cap is probably gonna be a little bit higher than uh, a, a little bit higher on our income than it would be if we had a full-time manager. So this is not always the case, but generally this is a consideration that we want to have. You don't want to assume that a buyer is going to underwrite your property exactly the way that you are running it. Uh, let's see, a few other questions have come in here. Um, do you have self-storage units in New Jersey? No, we do not have uh, units in New Jersey. Uh, let's see, typically, what are the job descriptions and expectations of boots on the ground? Um, good question there. Uh, so uh, generally, it's going to be uh, maintenance, maintenance related. So that person, while they're there, is going to walk around. They're going to make sure that there's no, um, you know, there's no repairs that need to be handled, make sure uh, that either that person should be taking care of the lawn maintenance or um, you should have a maintenance, a lawn maintenance contract in place. Um, but they would take care of those kind of things. They would sweep out uh, units that had been vacated. Uh, they would go around and uh, check for, uh, for tenants who have not paid. They would overlock those units. Um, those are the kind of things that they will, that they'll take care of when they're on site. So, you know, depending on the size of your facility, depending on different nuances that might be in place, that person may spend, you know, eight hours a week or they may spend, you know, 24 hours a week. It just kind of kind of depends on how your facility is set up and um, how big it is. Um, if you are, again, using a third property manager, um, they would be able to put together a good a job description for you of what this person will do, what the expectations are. So good question. Let's see, I don't see anything else coming in here. Um, so we'll go ahead and wrap it up. I appreciate the participation today. It's always good when we have lots of questions uh, when, we're, when we've got an interesting topic like this. So again, um, as you are looking to manage, if this is a way that you are looking to manage your facilities, you're wanting to go the remote manage route, 
make sure that you've taken into consideration maybe some improvements that you need to make from a security or logistics standpoint. Make sure that you are underwriting your exit correctly and make sure that you're not going, if you're, if you're acquiring a facility that has a full-time manager, make sure you're not gonna go cold turkey fully, re uh, fully remote because you will run into problems um, when you do that. Um, <clears throat> let's see, I got a couple of buzzer beater questions here that come in that I'll go ahead and get to. Uh, would you say um, corollary to unmanned, the expectation is the facility would leverage a lot more technology, cameras, locks, yeah. Yes, um, generally you are gonna want more, um, yeah, you'll have cameras. Uh, yeah, locks, I mean, um, there's, uh, I know there's different ways that you can do that. Um, but in general, yeah, you're going to need to implement some technology to be able to run an unmanned facility well. Um, and the last one is third-party management, cheaper in the unmanned model versus manned. Uh, the actual management fees, uh, no, you're not going to find them necessarily cheaper in unmanned. Where you're going to save costs on management and unmanned is the payroll cost uh, that we talked about. So, um, all right. I'm cutting it off there, but I'm very glad we had a lot of uh, questions this this webinar. So thanks everybody for attending. Um, check the schedule for the next one and uh, hope everybody has a great holiday season.